Yes. Uh -huh. Hello and welcome to uh, Beecraft Live. Um, I'm going to be your new host. I'm Rodri, one of the regular sort of contributors to the panel, and I've taken over the, the hosting of these events um, for the foreseeable future. We, we've got quite a, a special event this evening. We've got George from Arnia joining us, who's going to give us a, quite an interesting presentation on remote hive monitoring. Um, we've got quite a special event this evening. We've got George from Arnia. Mm. We're getting a bit of feedback there, Rod. A bit of feedback there. Bear with me one second. Sorry about that. There seems to be a bit of an echo there. So for those of you who are joining us live, um, if I can share my screen, I can show you. For those of you who are viewing through the website, can you see my screen okay? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. If you scroll down on the Beecraft website, you will see a little dialogue box saying, ask a question. Here you can ask us questions directly to the panel. Let me go back. No. Sorry, I've got a bit of lag this end. So, Over to the panel. Well, let's uh, do the introduction, starting with Wendy. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, very gentlemanly of you, Rodri, to uh, invite me first. Um, I'm Wendy. I'm the marketing manager for Beecraft. And uh, as you can see, it's quite dark in the background. So um, that's just because I haven't turned the lights on tonight. Um, <laughs> I've been, <laughs> I've been uh, beekeeper for what, about eight years and uh, did have an awful lot of hives, but I'm actually um, reducing the numbers this year. And um, absolutely love it just fell in love with the beekeeping and uh, i think we do we all do don't we we get hooked on it and um that's about it really uh, nothing much more to say other than um i enjoy very much the bees and my involvement with beecraft so and you're certainly a regular contributor to these events as well so, <laughs> well let me try that's it and yourself richard Yes, I'm Richard, I'm deputy editor of the magazine. So I spend most of my time thinking about um, what uh, is going to go in the magazine and what interesting things we can we can say. Um, I've just started work on the next edition, which is the May one, believe it or not. <laughs> so I've been working on editing a couple of articles and putting those together. I did nip up and see the bees today because the sunshine came out. So I went to see my main apiary and there wasn't a bee in sight. Um, which unfortunately is pretty much the story at the moment. It's a, been a terrible time here. There's only been two or three days in the last few weeks when the bees have been out um, and they're all very hungry, so they're needing quite a lot of fondant at the moment. The hives are very light, so I'm quite concerned about the state of them. Um, I, this time, I was looking at my diary, this time last year, the oilseed rake was flowering here. Um, okay. Yeah, and uh, I went to see it a couple of days ago and it's not even up to my ankles yet. So we're a good four to six weeks behind where we were last year, here in Wiltshire anyway. It's certainly been a very cold spring and it's been delayed somewhat, isn't it? It's, uh, it's going to be an interesting season this year. Well, it looks like we're about to have another week of rain, according to the forecast. So, uh, yep. And over to George. Um, would you like to give some introductions first, George, and then you can uh, start your presentation? Yeah, sure. Thank you. And, and thanks for the invites uh, to come along and talk tonight. It's much appreciated. Um, yes, my name is George Clouse and I work for Arnia. We're a, a company that has developed themselves a, a remote hive monitoring system. I've been with Arnia since the beginning. It's, I don't know how long that must be, uh, six years now, I think. Um, so, yes, and I, I was a beekeeper beforehand, and uh, which was a hobby, and now I've a hobby has ended up as, as business and it's uh it's been an interesting journey a lot of fun um and hopefully i can share with you some of the some of the insights that we can get from monitoring tonight it's certainly an interesting topic um i know i'm keen to learn quite a lot about it as i'm sure the, the viewers are as well so it's, yeah. great thanks so much shall, shall, shall i kick off now is yeah certainly yeah that'd be great um what I thought is we'll uh, we've, we've got several people watching live at the moment. So right. once you've uh, delivered your, your presentation and given us a bit of a background, we'll 
open up some questions and certainly if anybody's got any questions feel free to, to ask them. Right. Okay. Um, what I've got, I've just got a, a few slides and hopefully everybody can see the screen okay just to talk through because it's, it's, I think it's the easiest way with hive monitoring things to sort of show examples of, 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 of the data and what it shows about behaviours uh, of bees and, and the health of bees. Um, just a quick bit of background, as I mentioned before, uh, Arnie was founded by beekeepers, so we're not techies that were looking to apply technology to beekeeping. It was really a group of beekeepers that thought, wouldn't it be nice to know what's going on inside the hive without looking in? Um, and uh, the original inventor of the system is Hugh Evans, who's the top left there, uh, and his wife Sandra. Um, and that's how it all started, really, just, just sort of a classic sort of question, you know, wouldn't it be good if we do this, and then setting off down the road um, to do that. So, um, uh, and that was, I think, originally the company was founded, Hugh set it up back in 2010, I think. So, uh, yeah, so it's been, it's amazing how the time's flown. Um, so, uh, well, I'll move straight into how actually the technology works. And what we do is we put... Uh, hopefully we can see the, the cursor. On a hive, we fit sensors. So it could be a scale that goes under the hive or a brood temperature sensor in the brood box. Um, humidity sensors, we've got a microphone that sits at the front of the hive. So the sensors fit on the hive. Um, they then send the data from the hive wirelessly to what we call a, a gateway that sits centrally in the apiary. So that gateway unit is collecting data from all the hives in the apiary. It collects that data and then it sends it up to the cloud computer by one or two methods. We use the standard mobile phone networks where there is a network available. So it just sends the data up to the cloud computer. If there's no mobile phone network, and we do work in some parts of the world where there are no networks and some remote remote parts, we use satellites to send the data. Um, so the data then goes to a cloud computer and then the beekeepers can access their data from wherever they are from that computer just by dialing in on uh, on the internet so whatever device you're on whether it's a mobile phone a tablet computer you just go online any web browser and you can go on and then you can access the data that's coming from the hive so so it's it, it's 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 what's termed internet of things really th these days i think the modern terminology we didn't realize that's what we were doing but um it's where you're putting things on the internet and um, in this case we put hives on the internet and people can go online and see what's going on inside their hive um so in terms of what we monitor i've mentioned a few things already we, we look at the temperature in the brood nest the humidity um we look at the weight of the hive so that they're sort of quite common measurements uh, we also do acoustics. I think we're one of the people in the world that do that. Um, we can specifically pick out flight noise, fanning noise, the overall activity level of the colony, development of the colony. Um, we now are just launching a bee counter, so we can actually separately I count the number of bees that leave a hive and then the number of bees that return to the hive, which is really quite useful information for some people. Um, and that's just finished its trials uh, and it's, it's, it's providing some really fascinating information. We can also detect if the hive is moved, um, so if it's, if it's knocked over. Um, so in some parts of the world that could be a bear, um, in other parts of the world it could be uh, a drunken teenager I suppose. But, um, so yeah, so we can detect movement of different types and we also monitor the um, the AP weather conditions, the temperature, sun, the shade, and rainfall. Um, that's a nice scale that just sits under the hive, so if there's mesh flooring, debris, and rubber can drop out. Um, and it's basically just a, a digital scale that communicates to the cloud. Um, and it's quite a, quite a neat bit of kit. Um, that's a picture of gateway units that can be solar power charged. And that little box here next to it is the self-emptying rain gauge um, uh, to monitor rainfall. Um, and this, this unit sits centrally in the apiary. Um, in, in terms of who uses the data, uh, we started out really supplying mainly scientists, uh, an obvious market in some ways, who, who wanted data, detailed data about bees, the status of colonies, 
as part of their research into various aspects of bee health and behaviour. Um, and we've worked on many research projects in, in many parts of the world. Uh, we also work a lot with commercial beekeepers. They're really primarily interested in weights, tracking nectar flows, identifying start and finisher flows, when the hives are full, when they've got to take supers off, when they've got some bees and so on, and they can get that information remotely with hive monitoring. Um, we'd be increasingly selling to hobby beekeepers. Uh, hobby beekeepers just helps hobby beekeepers learn more about their bees. It's, you get new insight into the bees, their the status, their behaviours. Um, we're working more with schools now. We've got a lot of schools that uh, are using data from hives in, in their lessons, uh, which is fascinating and it's, it's becoming really, really popular. Um, not just to learn about bees, but actually the data is if they're learning maths or physics, how to plot a graph, for instance, if you're plotting the graph of a hive, it's, it's interesting for the kids to do that. Um, it's something real, and they're following bees on the internet. It's really interesting to see how much honey they've made, for instance. And at the same time, they're learning how to plot a graph and, and, and create, generate a graph. So it's actually we, some of our data is being used, for instance, to teach maths, um, which is which is great. Um, and they can follow that live. Uh, we're working with government departments. Uh, similar to scientists are interested in issues affecting bee health and behaviour and issues uh, around that, including things like agriculture and uh, farming methods. And increasingly big businesses, corporations that want to sponsor bees and help bees and monitoring bees as part of their sort of corporate social responsibility CSAR stuff is, is, is becoming increasingly popular as well. Um, so overall, we, we now have got bees in uh, 25 countries around the world. Um, so it's about five years, I think, since four to five years, I think, four years, I think, since we actually first launched the system. There was about three, four years of R and D. Um, so we're quite pleased with that. It's actually spread quite far and wide, and is used by much more people than we originally envisaged. Um, right. So moving on, to talk about the actual system and give you some data. When you first log in, this is what you see. So this is what we call sort of the apiary view. So uh, there's icons on the hive, so this one here is the brood temperature, the humidity, the ambient temperature. This indicates the acoustics, the weight of the hive, and this is the activity level of that colony at that point in time. So this is a snapshot of what's going on at the last time the, the, the hive logged in, and then the weather bar at the top gives you the weather over the last, the last week. Um, and the new user and trace we're doing will actually give you a forecast as well for, for your particular apiary site. Um, so it's a really nice, useful snapshot. This is what's this is what your hive sitting look across, um, and you can see here the bees will maintain the the brood to around about 34, 35 degrees when the queen's laying. So you can just look at this 34, 34, 33. You can see straight away all those colonies of queen rights at, at the time they logged in last time. To look at something in more detail, you just click on one of the icons. So if you want to click on hive weight, you just click on the hive weight icon and a graph of hive weight will pop up. Um, what I'm going to do now is just quickly run through some examples of, of the data going through the season, starting from around about now, springtime, through to winter to show you how you can gain insight using this, this sort of technology. Um, this graph, the first one I've got here, is uh, is a hive weight graph. Um, title where is spring? <laughs> uh, quite apt at the minutes, as uh, Richard was talking about. Um, this here shows hive weight declining. This is a little bit earlier. This is sort of um, uh, as you can see, the w weight loss accelerates coming into March, um, and you can see score levels getting quite low. Um, and one of the beauties of, of the system is that you can then you can build a picture of what's happening by adding sensors because usually one sensor will tell you something so well the hive weight is going down there and then if, for instance if you add your brood temperature to that you can see here this is classic that the brood temperature is unstable here uh, as I mentioned before the bees will regulate the brood to 34 35 degrees when the queen's laying and you can see at this point here the brood becomes stable and flat so, you know, looking at this, at this point in time, around, around about here, the queen started laying, so there's brood. Um, and then you can say, okay, well, what's, what's the activity levels like? And then you can plot, this is flight noise, so 
just to explain this, the this, the, the color is changing here, unfortunately. But the line here that's brooding, see again, brood stabilized. This is the weight line that's going down here, and the green line here is flight noise. And you can see the daytime peaks and flight noise. So you can see here in early Feb, very very little at all. And as time has gone on, um, there's more and more flight noise coming on here. You can see these big peaks here compared to earlier on. So essentially, what we've got here is is uh, a colony that's uh, obviously you know the colony's green, right? It's got brood. Um, and the bees are active, but clearly there's no food. So this is the situation with the hive, and, and, and this obviously would need to be checked from a, a point of view of feeding. But so it's telling you you've got active bees, uh, queen rat colony, but winter stores declining rapidly as the as the colony's got brood and become more active. Uh, moving on from the emerging from winter into first nectar flows. Um, this sh sh shows hive weight again, and this is a nectar flow. And ne when there's a nectar flow on, the scales are very accurate. It, it, so you don't just see a steady increase in weight. What we see is you actually see the behavior of the bees from the, the weight graph. So what you see here is you saw a drop in weight here, where it says forage, and this is the weight of the foragers leaving the hive during the morning. Um, and then you see the weight increase during the afternoon. And this is the bees return, the foragers returning. And at the end of the day, the hive weight is higher than at the beginning of the day, because they've come back with nectar. Overnight, you see the weight is a steady decline. And this is the bees evaporating the moisture from the, from, from the nectar processing it for capping. So you can actually pick up the weight of the moisture leaving the hive from the bees fanning. So, so what you see in active flow is this stepwise increase up here um, in the weight graph, um, and that's that's a classic active flow. Um, so it's interesting there. The weight can say you know you can actually and actually another thing is interesting. This graph, this actually is Italy. You can see it's quite early here. <laughs> uh, we won't get active flows at this time of year in this country. Uh, not, not certainly not at the minute. Um, there was some hot weather during the in the middle of the day and some of the bees were returning before going back out again so you can see these little humps here um so they're flying out coming back and then going out again they sort of come back for a lunch break before heading out to do a bit more foraging um adding flight noise again to weight graphs so the red is flight noise you see the stepwise increase in weight and you can see the big peaks of flight noise when the bees have gone out flying um Again, I haven't put it up, but, but you can compare colonies, for instance, so you can see which colonies are more active, which colonies are bringing in more weight. So you can plot the graph and compare two colonies directly, side by side, which is really useful information um, in terms of colony productivity, strength, so on. Um, moving on, it's something that is um, very useful as we come into spring is being able to plot weather. This graph look a little bit complex so I'll, I'll hopefully i'll explain it and hopefully you can you'll see this um i've plotted weather on here and this light blue line if you can see here where the cursor is that's temperature in the shade and the dark blue line is temperature in the sun so where the temperature in the sun is higher than temperature in the shade it's sunny because that sense is getting heated by the sun so you know the sunshine uh on the state you can see how hot, obviously you can see the temperature you're getting to over 30. Um, where this red arrow is, you see this point here, the temperature and the sun and the shade are the, are the same. And that's a cloudy day. And you can also see it's cooler than here. So you can tell when, it, not only does it tell you the temperature, it tells you if it's sunny or not, and whether it's cloudy. This green line, olive sort of green line here, that then jumps up. That's rainfall. Now we plot rainfall cumulatively. So if there's no rain, it's flat. When it rains, it goes up. So you can see that on this day, it's cloudy and it's rained. Um, the graph behind this is weight. So you can see here, weight going up on a sunny day, the bees are out foraging. Then it's on a rainy day here and cloudy day. There's no weight as you'd expect. The weight's not gone up. The bees haven't been out foraging. 
what's interesting is you can see the day after rain it's sunny and warm so the temperature's gone back up the sunshine but the way it doesn't go up um it's only the second sunny day here that you actually see a, a nectar flow properly return um so there's a delay in it despite the fact that it's warm and sunny that after rain and this is really a lot of the, the, the ne nectar producing flowers can be delayed by the rainfall and so they can be it could be sunny it can be warm the bees can go out flying but there won't be much nectar for them um and we spotted this in many on sometimes it's 24 hours sometimes it's 48 hours in different parts of all over the world this this seems to happen again it's and so it 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 shows you how important weather is of in all beekeepers will know that intuitively but it's useful to see this so for instance if you've got spring weather this time of year where you've got days where it's rainy then you might have a couple of days of sunshine i think great they're out and about will be you know they'll be bringing something back but actually and then it's rainy again and then a day or two of sunshine and rain again which is very often spring weather in many parts of the in many parts of the the temperate climate that's the spring um but you could have that sort of weather for a couple of weeks and and, and although they're getting out in between times they won't be bringing anything back and again you can follow this you can actually understand what's going on with the colony and you can see um you can see this this this, this sort of the stasis in this way um moving through uh this one is g looking at autumn and you can see this you can monitor your feeding so here you can see this beekeeper started feeding syrup and you can see the, the vertical increase in weight as the syrup being added you can see the weight decrease afterwards as a mixture of uh evaporation of the moisture from the syrup and con consumption of the syrup but what you know is you can see he's been adding regular feed and he gets this point here and he knows how much how much has actually been stored you know is which is much less than he's put on um because it's going up and down but you know what stores so he knows it's gone from mid th low 30 kilos to over 60 kilos here um in terms of coming into winter, um, winter because I mentioned this is brood temperature, and again you can see the, the temperature stable here. Then it starts to decline, and then this is winter, and it's it's variable. It's following ambient temperatures. The big peaks in temperature are the, the cluster moving over the sensor. So when it gets particularly warm, then you can see here towards the end of February, this queen started laying again. So you can see when your queens stop laying. And then you can see when she started again. And at this time of year, you won't be looking in. So it's quite nice to know without looking in your queen rice and she's laying. Um, and this graph plots humidity on top of that. And the red line is humidity. And you can see again, humidity is regulated um, during the summer and then rises during the winter. And then it comes back together again here. Uh, this is late February, early March. Um, when the, when the brood and this is a, a great graph i think in terms of showing clearly showing how how the high homeostasis how the bees really control the environment and the brood nest really very effectively and efficiently um when there's a brood uh actually i've got these a bit around the swarming season i should this in the middle shouldn't i but uh swarming is an, is an interesting one here you can see a nectar flow again you can see the steps we, we always see the first swarms tend to be after the first decent nectar flow of the season. Uh, you can see the way we pick up the, all, the sudden weight drop of all the bees leaving the hive at once. And we can pick that up. Um, if we had flight noise, you can see a big surge in flight noise um, at the same time as the weight drops. Um, uh, so again, that's, this confirms that this is a swarm. Um, Here's another drop in weight, which is quite interesting. Two days running, big drops in weight. I think so this I've lost 10 kilos um, over two days. Um, when we looked at this particular one, you can see these peaks in, in flight noise, and this was actually robbing. And we're picking up the, 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 the robbing bees at the, um, at the hive entrance, and this sudden drop in weight. But this was a, bigger than a swarm. This is 10 kilos. So this is clearly not just a swarm of bees, it's, um, which is typically two, three kilos. Um, so, uh, but there's a sharp rise in flight noise 
uh, and this is robbing. So again, now we can identify these behaviors. We can put in alerts to, and the beekeeper can actually be notified automatically of, of changes in the sensor readings, um, sudden changes. Uh, something that we, we picked up last year for the first time actually is, is mating flights. Um, and this graph shows hive weight and fanning noise. And you can see the swarm here on the 7th of May. And it's been observed that the bees in the colony will, will sometimes the whole colony will fan when the queen's out on a mating flight. Um, and we can pick up fanning noise. And you can see here the queen will, about two weeks after the, the swarm, there's huge peaks in, in fanning noise. And we've observed this in working with beekeepers as well. Uh, use the kit. This is being confirmed. This is queen mating flight. So we can actually pick those up from the fanning of the bees. And this usually occurs around about 12 to 14 days or so after the swarm. Um, and you can plot a rainfall. And you can see here that the couple of days before the swarm, before the mating flight, it was raining. The screen line here, but it was obviously it was dry and you can and warm. Um, on the day of the actual mating flight. Um, talking about the future and some of the other things we're doing, um, you mentioned swarming there. This is this is something we've been working on for a long time, and it's actually been able to predict swarming. And we, we're very close to this now. Um, this is a graph produced by someone called Eddie Woods that was published in Nature in 1959. Some of you may may, may not have heard, heard of Eddie Woods. And he picked up this noise that bees make. He was a BBC sound engineer uh, and a beekeeper, and he identified this noise, the warble, which this is where it occurs on the frequency. So this is a frequency spectrum in hertz across the bottom here, and this is where the warble occurs. And we thought, well, actually, we could pick this up digitally, and we can. Uh, this graph shows, this is like slices, each, each slice is a day, so it's in 3D, of the frequency spectrum of a colony. The noise of a bumblebee, of a honeybee colony, and um, you can see here this is a colony that didn't swarm, and you can see here this is a colony that did swarm, and you can see this this warble being picked up here, really quite easily two weeks before the actual swarm. And what we're doing at the minute is developing an algorithm that will actually pick this up automatically, and then alert the beekeeper. Um, so we're running some. Uh, some maths and development of algorithms at the minute on this, but we've been recording swarming bees for seven years now. So it's taken that long to get this data um, and get sufficient data that we can uh, develop some algorithms based on this. Another thing that we're doing, we, we, acoustics is, is an area of expertise for us. And one of the things that we, we will be rolling out this year is an Asian Hornet alert detector that we can actually pick up the specific acoustic signature of Asian Hornets walking at a beehive. Um, uh, he yeah. did some work in Italy last year in Liguria, recording hornets. This is an area that's got a serious problem with them, and we can now identify this. So we can remotely identify, locate, and then alert of an Asian hornet attack. We've got uh, systems rolling out this year as a first, as a pilot phase, um, and actually the monitoring will identify the behaviours because one of the reasons bees struggle is not it's not just the hornets. The, the bees that get eaten by the hornets, effectively. Um, it's the fact that the colony does this, it stops flying, um, they stop foraging, um, and obviously stores decline rapidly. Um, and we'll be able to re record behaviours of things like uh, of what happens to the queen, and does the queen stop laying during this as well? We're not sure. But that's something we'll be able to find out as well. Um, so, uh, I've given you a little snippet of some of the things, the new things we're working on. Um, just And hopefully that's given you a flavour of the sorts of things. I could have gone on forever. Uh, I'm a right ball with graphs and bee data. Um, but um, I hope I've given you a few examples of key points in the season. Um, I mean, just to conclude, I mean, this this is a new technology. Although we've been at it for quite a few years, but it's still a new technology. And it's, it's still developing all the time. Um, and its full, its full application to beekeeping will evolve and is evolving all the time. The more we, the more we monitor, the more we learn, the more we identify what's useful and what isn't useful. Um, uh, another thing, a lot of some be traditional beekeepers say as well, you know, you still, 
you can't rely on this. And, and this is not, not we're saying that remote monitoring won't do beekeeping for you. That's not what's intended. It's a tool for beekeepers. It provides new insight, new information about conditions and stations of economy and, and, and information that you wouldn't otherwise know. Um, you don't know, the, unless you weigh your hive, you don't know the actual weight. Unless you monitor temperature in the brood, you don't actually know it. So it's giving you new information. It doesn't mean to say you can leave alone, you, you just leave your bees and that's it. No, it doesn't do beekeeping. It's just giving you insights to help beekeepers manage bees. Um, and uh, we really do believe it, 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 it can do that. Um, and from a hobbyist, uh, you know, you learn more about bees. You, you, it's, it's interesting. It's fascinating. If you've got an interest in bees, then this to, this you learn more. You get more insight into the behaviour of the bees. Um, and you can you can disturb them less in terms of if everything's looking just great. Um, your queen writes it's the summer and there's, there's a flow on. You can leave them alone to do their business. You don't necessarily have to go and look to check that the queen's there. Um, so um, so that's it. So hopefully that's given you a little a little flavour. And um, yes, of course, um, I can take any questions as and when they arise. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you very much. I, I've got one question, actually. Can I put you on the spot? Would it be possible to go back to the, the photograph of the actual unit with the solar panel? On? <coughs> yeah. I, I was just wondering, is, is, so the, I, I've never actually seen the unit, so the, you've got the rain gauge there, the solar panel, and then the actual uh, sensors are contained within the enclosure there, are they? Or? No, that, that's, that's the gateway unit that sits central in the apiary. Right, okay. So this, is, uh, this is not actually on the hive. So, um, uh, so this so is... The, that, the that, sensor that's, units, they sit within the hive. Do they? Uh... Well, no, actually, I'll click to this one. This is so the scale sits under the hive, mm -hmm. and there are, uh, in terms of the brood sensors, there's a humidity and, and temperature sensor, and they, they're on little wires, thin wires that come out of the, the back of the scale and just get fed into the hive and dropped mm -hmm. into the, uh, the brood nest between the brood frames. Um, and the microphone just sits at the hive entrance. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, that sort yeah. of ties into a question which Paul Hancock says uh, requested. Yeah. He said, "How would you power the equipment when not near a mains connection?" Uh, you, you don't need mains power; they're, they're battery powered. So, if I flip back to this picture again, you can see this gateway box that's got four diesel batteries in it, like torch batteries. So, um, uh, it, it's self-powered. It, it, it's in that sense the batteries will last uh, they can't just run about three to six months um depending how how much data you're collecting how often you're sending it back um and as if you plug a solar if you have a, a rechargeable battery in a solar panel then uh the battery shouldn't shouldn't need changing um, oh, really? Really? <laughs> so uh uh yes you don't you don't need mains power and you don't need wi-fi in the apr either because it has its own it has a sim card uh, in the gateway unit, it's got a modem and SIM card, so it's got it's, it's like a mini mobile phone inside there, really, um, and it sends all the data. So you don't need you, don't, you do need a mobile phone signal, but you don't need Wi-Fi. Great, and George, the sensors that go into the hive, you've got yeah, a microphone, something or other to detect humidity and temperature. Yeah, do you? Do you move those? I'm thinking about the fact that a brood nest, you know, it tends to expand or detract or move to one side slightly. Will that affect the readings you get? Do you find you have to perhaps move the sensors a little bit as the season progresses? Yes, sometimes during the season. Um, it, what we recommend is that the, the brood temperature sensor just sits as close to the centre of the brood areas, the brood nest as you, as you can get it. So if it does move, you just, you might you know, take it, it just drops over a frame, you just pull it out and you just drop it over the next frame. Um, so, uh, yes, you sometimes need to do that um, during the season. If, if you're looking in and you think, oh, well, I'll just, I'll just move that across. Um, we do, we are looking at technology now which will have multiple sensors across all the frames. So, next generation technology, you'll be able to uh, get a 3D picture of the brood nest, um, which is quite exciting. So, um, and how do the bees react to the sensors? Do they 
properized into the frames or anything like that? That was going um, to be my next question. Uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it, no, the, 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 yeah, I mean, they, they don't, they're not affected by propolis. The, the, the humidity sensor may need, uh, the end of it may need, you may need to pick a bit off sometimes if that's get propolized up, but the, the humidity sensor can sit, doesn't have to sit right in the middle of the brood. It can just sit in the side of the, the brood chamber. Um, and the bees tend to leave it alone. Um, it, some bees propolize more, things more than others, but the temperature sensor is completely unaffected by propolis. So you do sometimes find that the wires get stuck down with propolis and things like that. Um, but, but the actual ends of the sensors don't get much in my experience. And you know, they can get a little bit around the end, but the, actually the, the, the temperature sensor is completely unaffected by it. And the microphones at the hive entrance, um, either it can be just inside the hive entrance on the floor or just outside the hive entrance above above the door, above the entrance, or it can be even in some, we have even tried it attached to the mesh floor on the outside underneath, just at the hive entrance. So anywhere around the hive entrance, so it can get noisome inside and noisome outside as the bees fly. And, um, and that just never gets touched, uh, just gets left alone um, on the whole. So, so, you know, we don't get much problems with that. I suppose one other question, you touched upon uh, the use for hive thefts and detecting movement uh, with the increase in hive thefts, you know, that's happening, especially in the UK at the moment. Uh, have you seen an increase in, you know, use for that specific reason? Um, not really. Um, we've had, um, uh, I think there's two instances where hives that our system have been on have been robbed or stolen um in one of them it turned out that the sensor did actually help because it was sending an alert of the the drop in hive weight in the hive moving mm. to the beekeeper and uh he checked the next morning his hive was still there so uh, it happened the same the, the next night and then actually it, it, it was actually used to to catch the, the thief because it was actually his next door neighbour stealing honey from inside the hive. Um, um, this was in Europe; it wasn't in, in the UK. So um, don't so, give them ideas. Uh, yes, yeah, so <laughs> and actually, apparently, the police did use the use the data from the hive as is, is, uh, as part of the evidence. But yeah, so but we haven't. I mean, we're still monitoring a tiny, tiny proportion of hives. So it's, so there's only there's only twice we're actually aware of uh, of, of situations where. The hive we've been monitoring has has been stolen or stolen from. Um, I mean, we, we don't have a GPS tracking, so it, it will detect movements, but it won't it won't track it and tell you where it is. That's a, you need GPS trackers for that. We have looked at that sort of technology. Um, there are other people I think around that do cell systems like that that could be used um, already. So um, we've not really gone into that. Uh, that is an area uh, specialism for us. Although we may we may offer more, but at the minute it's just it's quite easy for us to put a sensor in because we've, we've got a board and we just put the sensor on and it will just detect movement. Um, so, um, so we thought we might as well have it in there. Although, like I said, we haven't got a special tracking unit, which is a different technology altogether. Are they very popular for the scientific community then? You know, you said they started development with the scientific community. Is there active research ongoing with using the product at the moment? Yes, yeah. I mean, uh, um, uh, we're associated with Bee Health. We're just about to start a project this year, I think, looking at chronic bee paralysis. Um, we've done work with people who are investigating Varroa. Um, uh, Nasima, we've done work on acoustics, looking at Varroa and Nasima as well. Um, obviously, the Asian Hornet work is is linked with scientific work. Um, we've been involved in projects that have looked at uh, neonicotinoids um, and their impact on colonies. So, yes, yeah, so it's 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 when it's scientific work, our data is being used in conjunction with other data. So, basically, it's not just hive monitoring. They will also be doing other things to the colony. So, for instance, they may be collecting samples of bees to examine. They may be collecting samples of pollen, uh, samples of honey, etc., etc., and taking other measurements and 
an inspection. So when it's a research project, they're monitoring and measuring all sorts of different things. And the hive data is part of the package of data, as it were. It just gives them something new that they couldn't otherwise have got, um, uh, where they can, um, you know, one of the things we're looking at is, is um, on, a, on a project in France is, is where we're monitoring temperature on every frame um, to see the size of the brood nest. Um, and uh, this is in relation to, to Varroa. So, um, yeah, so it's, 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 it's a big area for us. And it was the area where we really started out, really, which was sort of working with scientists that wanted this data. And it's, it's, it's quite often these sort of technologies that start as a scientific instrument and then it, you know, it'll get a bit cheaper and simpler and easy to use and make and, and so on. And then it migrates into something that anybody could use. And we're sort of on that journey now. So, um, uh, yeah. Something which sounded interesting was the uh, the ability to count the bees coming in and out of the hive. That, that's definitely something which is that's yeah, a novel that, idea. It's a good indication of activities. So. That's right. I mean, it's interesting. The reason, one of the reasons we do, we were asked, we were actually asked to do that. And it was for some commercial beekeepers in the USA, and it was to do with um, crop uh, bee colony deaths, uh, sudden deaths and which they felt were linked to crop spraying and one of the things that we want to monitor is if, if you know how many bees go out and then how many bees come back you can look at death rates sort of in the field what might be a normal death rate then you look at days when maybe suddenly large numbers of bees don't come back um and uh, uh so that was the reason we did it and they and we we piloted it this year on the almond groves in california and it worked extremely well, and there's some really interesting data come back from it. Um, and the beekeepers are working with the because it, it, you know there was there's this thing in the states with the almond growers where it's, it's a huge business for for pollinators in terms of there's about one and a half to two million beehives moved to um, uh, California, but um, there was instances of bees dying and so on, and were the growers spraying and this sorts of things. So there's um, and uh, there's other areas we're looking at using it in terms of uh, looking at productivity of bees. So, you know, if you know how many bees have come back and how much the weight's gone up, you can start to look at the actual, almost how much how much nectar individual bees are bringing back. Um, yeah. 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 So, and then in terms of other aspects of, of um, you know, even the neonic debate in terms of you know what's the, what's the impact of neonics on the bees and and um you know are the bees taking longer to come back or they a few of them coming back you know um what's their progress what's their pro is it impacting their productivity so um it has lots of lots of different applications i think yeah there's definitely development potential um yes yeah yeah, yeah. So so what, what, it, what does the future hold for the technology you know it's just going to grow and grow i suppose yeah i mean i think i think it will i think um it's it, it will evolve uh, um, uh, Early adopters, you know, technology it will then be integrated with hives, so you'll be able to buy a, a smart hive with sensors in it that talks really? to the internet. And I think that, that's the natural sort of direction I think the technology will move in. Um, so, um, and that's something we're working on as well. So, it's so it's it, 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 it I think in it, it's still very new and. There is some scepticism amongst some beekeepers about it, but I think in time it it, it will prove. It, it, I think it's already starting to prove itself the value of it. Um, and I see a point in time. I don't know how many years away, but where it will become quite the norm. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, uh, um, but, and the price will come down significantly as well, obviously. But um, yeah, and I think it will be used. But most, be, a lot of beekeepers will use this. You'll just be able to buy a smart hive and connect it to the internet. Yeah, well, we've got a question that's come through from John Forster. Yep. He's asked, can you yep. tell me how many hives can be run on one of these, or do you have to have separate ones for each hive? Um, right. 
Yeah, then, the, then um, the question, most importantly, so, what does it cost? So I'm sure we can okay. put it in contact. <laughs> right, yes, yes. So, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, the, the gateway unit that I've got here, I actually still got the picture up. Um, you need one of them in an apiary, and that can collect information from, uh, say, 10 to 15 hives, uh, however many has been monitored in that apiary. Um, but obviously, you can only get data from an individual hive that's actually got sensors on it. So, um, but you don't necessarily need to monitor every single hive. So, for instance, co the commercial beekeepers, the system we work with them is, we, we call it a sentinel system because they monitor a sample of hives at an apiary. And there might only be, two, usually it's two to four, depending on how many they've got there. So it's not a huge number. And they're really interested in weight. And weight's something you don't need to monitor in every hive. So if you've got an apiary of 30 hives, you monitor four of them. Whatever, what they're doing with weight, you, you've got four, so you've got, so if there's a dud one or something not right, you know, you've got enough there. Um, we'll pretty much tell you what's going on for the rest of the, the apiary. So in that instance, you don't need to monitor every hive. You can actually look at a nectar flow as an apiary from monitoring a sample of them. Um, and that works really, that's really cost effective for farmers. I mean, we, we did a study with a, a commercial beekeeper um, uh, where they got a, they got an 18% increase in the honey yield using monitoring just from timing, just from knowing when the nectar flows were starting and finishing at different sites. Um, uh, so, so that ends. however, if you want to know uh, the brood temperature of a colony, you've got to have a brood sensor in it. So you can't use brood temperature, for instance, you can't use that as a proxy because that will vary between colonies, unlike weight. So, so certain things, if you want to know uh, about conditions, the, the humidity and, and brood temperature, if you want to know about acoustics and flying, then you've got to actually have something. Those sensors have got to be on each hive. So um, for a, if you just want to monitor those things, then a hive monitor is £150 per hive. And and then you need a gateway unit uh, centrally for the AP, which is which is two hundred fifty pounds. <coughs> so they're the sort of prices. Uh, uh, high scales. We've got different types of high scale. We've got some with really really uh, accurate scales that go down to fifteen grams. Some that go down to one hundred grams. Um, again, depending on the high scale you've got, whether you've got the, the that full metal plate or we've got a slightly uh, we've got a like a like a, a, a self-assembly high scale so high scales can be very anything between sort of two and four hundred pounds um so they're the sorts of order of magnitude of, of prices um so it really depends what you're monitoring um so uh but i mean the hive monitor say for 150 pounds you gotta you know that that's um it's sophisticated technology i mean it's got microphones boot temperature humidity you know, we're in, connected to that. You've got it's. It's not just that you've actually got a. We've got a computer, a cloud server. We've got a user interface. It's analysing the data. It's got algorithms. We can interpret flight noise, fanny noise. So you know, um, there's more technology in in the system than there is in an iPhone. Um, and uh, you know, you can buy a bee suit for hundred odd pounds, um, which is cotton and thread. Um, it depends what you know so yes it's expensive but actually relatively speaking for the technology and, and what it's doing and you think of the whole structure that we've got behind that in terms of databases and com cloud computers user interface it's um uh you know it's it's yes it's a lot but i think in time that will come down significantly um as we go forward and as you said, this type of technology could become the norm in a couple of years' time. Yes, I think I think I think it will. I think um, it, it's at the minute it was, it's it's about education. This is why this sort of event's so useful because I think it's just it's just really explained to people, you, you know, what this sort of technology does, how it can help you understand the, uh, the status of your bees, how you can learn more about your bees, um, how it can help with with bee husbandry. And the other, the, the other big thing that we're doing is that, obviously, the more highs the monitor, the more we learn about bees all the time. 
like this year we've got an Asian Hornet model, we've got a bee counter, we've got we're developing the swarm algorithm, we're sort of so and this happens every every year there's something new. And the and the way we work it is that our our sort of community, if you like, of beekeepers monitoring the bees, as we identify say a, a, a new signature of bee health or behaviour, we can then actually automatically up that upload that we just put it into our user interface and then everybody gets it all over the world. So anybody in any of the 25 countries that are using it, if we get a swarm algorithm, we'll put it into our user interface, then they'll all get a swarm algorithm. Um, so it, it, it's, so, 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 so that is learning and growing all the time. Uh, so all the data from the beekeepers that are using it, we analyze that aggregated data, what we learn from it, we then give back um, so that, you know, we get better and better all the time and learn new things. I'm interested to know, um, this might not necessarily be something that you can answer directly, but you mentioned people uh, using these to study Varroa. Yeah. Um, are, are they, is anybody looking at comparing the temperature and humidity in different types of hive? Um, and I'm thinking, of, for example, people who keep warre hives say that yes. the increased temperature and humidity, quite important, um, is something that um, can peak and that can affect um, varroa and varroa drops and so forth. So is there any anyone studying the combination of temperature and humidity and, and correlating that with you know, measuring varroa drop or varroa uh, populations? Yeah, I, I think uh, there, is a, there is some work going on at the minute relating to temperature humidity in row and we've got a project going on that at the minute the one thing that um uh, and there's some quite interesting sort of findings coming up from that actually but um yeah the different hive things are an interesting one we, we haven't done it actually we've always wanted to do it we've just never quite got around to it but i think in terms of there's a lot talked about poly hives wooden hives different different types of hives wbc hives worry hives you know um and um uh, you know temperatures and humidities and things like that um but it would be an absolutely fantastic bit of work to sort of get together to get you know to look at those because obviously people will say you know we can't often have opinions on this but it's not necessarily backed with data mm. um, so actually you know what what the actual temperature and humidities are and actually what is the impact on the colony of that is it is it good or bad or, or does it make no difference um and uh, that would be lovely and fascinating to do, and it's something we've always wanted to do, to be honest. Um, and uh, we'd love to do it. And it's actually what, actually, one of the things we're trying to do in the UK at the minute is launch something called the, the Honeybee Observatory, which we hope will, will, will. That's one of the things we'd like to tackle with it. Was where we we get beekeepers. Many we're hoping associations, in particular beekeeping associations, will join into this. Monitor a couple of hives at the April. If we can get sufficient sites to do this across the uk then we've got like an observatory because we've got a, a critical mass of bees that we're monitoring beehives are monitoring and we could set that up to look at different types of hive in different locations mm -hmm. and do this sort of work and then share it with the group so mm -hmm. we've got associations all doing that they actually become part of the observatory and then we we conduct experiments they can do them individually at their local apri and we can do them nationally and then we share the data everybody and it's a big big learning a big sort of citizen science research project um so um and that's so that, that's a good question it's something we specifically would like to do actually um and we can actually record inspections on the system as well so online you can record uh varroa uh counts and so on um along with other things so the, the observations and inspections and treatments and manipulations done by the beekeeper can actually be recorded as well along with the data um, so it could be quite powerful mm -hmm. well, I think we've got time for one more question and again John Forster has asked one uh, would the sensors need to be removed for varroa control like vaping would this affect the sensors so, so again, sorry, would, would... would the sensors need to be removed from the hive um, when you're introducing varroa control like vaping oxalic acid um no um we haven't had any issues with that at all we have actually gathered some really quite interesting data from different rural treatments uh, we haven't published this yet but we did do a project looking at um the impact of rural treatments on on the environment in the hive and the bees um 
we've identified some interesting behaviors in terms of for instance uh, fanning massive increases in fanning as they try to ventilate the hive um mm -hmm. stuff like that so uh and so we have done some work looking at that um and that's not published yet so i can't really say a great deal about it it's not quite finished yet but uh yeah but, but, but again it's another example of this we've got a list of 30 40 50 projects i think we'd love to do um with the system um it's uh it's getting around to doing them all but yeah yeah time i suppose but, uh, yes and uh speaking of time we, we've run out so uh yeah um we've had a, quite a few questions coming through actually relating specifically to the purchasing of the units so i'm sure we'll uh put you in uh, contact with George, who I'm, I'm sure will be interested in uh, speaking to you and providing further advice. And well, thank you very much everyone for your yeah. time. And uh, yep. Th thank you very much. And, and if everybody's got any, any specific questions, I guess if they email them to, you know, about the technology or anything they never got to ask them, or they occur, one occurs to them afterwards, by means people, if you email me questions, I can answer them, it's no problem yeah, at all. Certainly, certainly, fantastic. Uh, well, our next Hangout is on the 25th of April, where we'll be covering the topic of uh, spring build-up, which will be quite interesting given the, uh, the the ongoing cold weather we've had this spring. I know we were, before we started this event, we were talking about uh, how delayed things are this year. So uh, I'm sure that'll be quite interesting. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Bye from me. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 See you next Bye. Time. Bye.